being on time. Hello, welcome back. Day two of the We the People National Invitational. This is unit one with Falls Creek Junior High School from Indiana. My name is Christine Holt and I will be your facilitator today. In a moment, I will have the judges introduce themselves followed by the students and then we will begin the hearing. Students will deliver a four minute prepared statement followed by eight minutes of judge questions. My microphone will be muted during the hearing and I will hold up one minute and time signs. I suggest that you use gallery view and all of the students have been spotlighted and will appear at the top of the screen. At the conclusion of the hearing, judges will give brief feedback to the teams and then we will conclude. Judges, I give you the floor. Well, it's good to be back with you guys. It's, uh, I've enjoyed meeting you the last couple of days. This has been great. Uh, I'm Tim Moore from the Center for Society of the American Constitution at UW-Madison. And my colleagues are. I'm Clifton St. Greider Jones with the University of Louisville's McConnell Center. And I am still Alan Broadman from a former or retired teacher from East Brunswick High School in East Brunswick, New Jersey. And you guys are? We are Unit 1 from Fall Creek Junior High. My name is Rohan Epen. I'm Janad Hassan. My name's Misha Malbris. And my name's Arjun Tawar. Our sponsors are Mr. Bradshaw and Mrs. Medeiros. It's nice, nice to see you again. Okay, let's get right to question two, if that's all right. If man in a state of nature be so free as has been said, if he's absolute lord of his own person and possessions, equal to the greatest and subject to nobody, why in the world would he ever part? Okay, sorry. Why would he part with his freedom? Why will he subject himself to the dominion and control of any other power? How did Locke answer these questions? According to Locke and Jefferson, what is natural law in a state of nature? Do you agree or disagree with their reasoning? Why or why not? Why or what did Locke mean by the social contract? Why did he think it necessary? What obligations does the contract place on government and on the individual? You may begin. John Locke believes that Although people in a state of nature have more freedom, these freedoms are constantly at risk and aren't guaranteed. John Locke stated in the second treatise of government, to which it is obvious to answer that though in the state of nature he had such a right, yet the adjoinment of it is very uncertain and constantly exposed to the invasion of others. John Locke believed that it's better to have protected rights rather than freedom that is constantly at risk. According to John Locke and Thomas Jefferson, Natural law is a set of unchanging moral rules that says that all people should respect each other's natural rights, even in a state of nature. John Locke wrote in his second treatise of government, the state of nature has a law of nature to govern it, which obliges everyone, and reason that which is that law that teaches all mankind who will but consult it, that being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. We agree with John Locke's point of view. However, however, we still think that a social contract is necessary. Although there is a law of nature that people should follow when in a state of nature, without a social contract, there is no guarantee that people will follow natural law. Therefore, both natural law and a social contract are necessary for establishing and protecting the rights of human beings. By social contract, Locke meant that people should give up aspects of their natural rights to the government so that in return, the government can secure their protection. Although the government is organizing and protecting people's rights, government officials must also follow their policies as they are a subcategory of the people. He wrote in his second treaties of government, no one can force men to form a government. They have to agree to create a social contract. The perfect freedom that they enjoyed in a state of nature must be set aside and the power to legislate and punish must be placed in an authority. He believed that a social contract was necessary because it offers more safety than an organization for the people than a state of nature where there is no social contract. In a social contract, the government formed by the consent of the people takes the responsibility of the protection of their rights while respecting the natural rights of the people. An example of the government infringing on the people's natural rights would be the abuse of eminent domain. This can be seen in Kilo v. City of New London, where the city took away Suzette Kilo's right to private property without her consent in order to build a private pharmaceutical building. The city of New London argued that the construction of the building would offer jobs and increase tax revenue, even though it was a private company. 
When they offered compensation for her house, she refused because she wanted to keep her property. As a result, the city confiscated her home and they never even used the land. This is a clear abuse of power as the government took Suzette Hilo's right to property without consent or a fair compensation. The social contract requires citizens to give up their unlimited freedom in exchange for protection from the government. While it may seem counterintuitive, all people give up their unlimited freedom so that not one person has enough power to exploit the rights of others without facing consequences. In order to receive protection of their rights, the people are obligated to follow the agreed upon moral and political rules in their social contract. According to John Jock Rousseau's The Social Contract, what man loses by the social contract is his natural liberty and an unlimited right to everything he tries to get and succeeds in getting. What he gains is civil liberty and the proprietorship of all he possesses. Here Rousseau says that the social contract requires citizens to give up the endless freedoms they have in a state of nature, and in return, the government must provide them protection. An example of this today is with the restrictions of COVID-19. The citizens agreed to a new social contract that recommends them to wear masks and stay within country borders. In return, it is the government's job to react to the pandemic, making sure to decrease the effect that the coronavirus has had on the United States. This concludes our paper. We are now ready for your questions. Okay. Um, I'd like to focus in on this idea of rights that and you talked about this, the purpose of government basically is the protection of these rights. Okay. Now, what I want to know is under what circumstances, if any, should government be able to limit my rights? I believe that the government is allowed to limit the people's rights if the people have violated the social contract. An example of this is when, when you're driving. When you're driving, you, send, you sign a new social contract of following all the laws of driving making sure you're un, and making sure that you're under the speed limit. However, if you're speeding, then you're, you are violating that social contract so, that, so then the government has the right to take your money, which is also your property. I agree with my colleague Rohan that the government should be able to limit your natural rights if you are, um, if you are a threat to other people's natural rights. Another example of when government is limiting or taking away your natural rights is on death row. If you've committed a crime so heinous and taken somebody else's natural right to life, the government does have a right to take away your natural right to life. I agree with both my colleagues, Misha and Rohan, but some people might disagree. As John Locke said in his second treatise of government, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. So. This includes the government as they are a subset of the people. So they in turn should not be able to harm another's natural rights. Do you think there's any state of nature's right now anywhere? I personally, sorry, you may go. I believe that no, there is no state of nature in act uh, right now because a state of nature requires people to have no social contracts and people um people's instinct is to automatically form into groups and create social contracts so i believe that it is not possible for a state of nature to exist currently uh, i agree with my colleague arjun not only do i think that we don't have a, so a state of nature currently i don't think we've ever had a state of nature aristotle writes in book one of his book politics that man is by nature a political animal so it's only natural for people to join a social contract and form groups. People may argue that in a state of war, you are in a state of nature. However, according to the Geneva Conventions, which state what you can and can't do uh, during war, that in itself is a social contract. Therefore, uh, humans have always been part of a social contract and, never, and ha therefore have never been in a state of nature. But what, okay, I'm gonna be that weird guy. Uh, I want to go to southeast, excuse me, southwest Indiana, live in the in the hills in my cabin, just my dog, no electricity, no running water. Have I left the social contract? Am, am I am I in a state of nature? I believe that if you are alone and you are not in contact with any other humans, then you are allowed to be in a state of nature because there are no rights that you have that you have to respect. <clears throat> for others besides your own. I agree with my colleague Rohan that 
if you were completely alone, then and you don't have you're not part of a social contract, then maybe you would be in a pseudo state of nature. <laughs> However, I think that humankind as a whole has never been in a state of nature. And even if you live in this remote in the forest, you still have to follow laws. You can't just go and burn the entire forest down. So that's still, you're still in a social contract. It's just that you're in, uh, you have less obligation to the social contract than people who live in an urban area. In addition, I believe that uh, people, people require um, be immediate, like seeing other people to survive. Um, when we go to the market and we buy food, we see tons of other people. So I mm -hmm. think that there will always be a reason or there will always be a time where you'll come in contact with a person no matter what. Thank you. All right, here's a new question. What should people have the right to do if they think that government is not doing, if it does not serve the purpose for which it was created? What do people have the right to do? I believe that, gov that the people have the right to peacefully protest against what the government have not done or is currently infringing on the people's natural rights, whether it be that they're just not giving them rights or if they're not following the civic virtue. Uh, I actually disagree with my colleague Janai saying that they only have the right to peacefully protest. John Locke writes that if the government is not doing its job of protecting the natural rights, that the people do have a right of revolution, which is not always peaceful. However, I think this is a re last resort and that you should try peaceful protest first. If the government is truly failing their purpose, the people do have a right to uh, start a revolution. I think that the people should also keep in mind the amendments of the constitution and laws of the constitution. So as my colleague Misha was saying, they should start out peacefully protesting because if they start out to rebel and violate the natural rights of others, they would also be violating the constitution. So let's say I've tried all those wonderful, peaceful concepts and they haven't worked. So I stand there on my hill and I am revolting. And I even armed myself under the second amendment. Does government have to now say, okay, well, he's revolting. We let him revolt. Is that, is that what happens there? Well, well the truth, you may go. Thank you. In this circumstance, I believe that the government wouldn't recognize that the, that the, that what the citizen is doing, that what the citizen is doing is right, because in their mind, what they are doing is right. So the government will fight back against the citizen. But I personally believe that the citizen does have the right to rebel against the government with force if these peaceful protests are not effective. I agree with my uh, colleague Rohan uh, that you do have a right uh, in a way if you're not breaking uh, somebody else's natural rights. However, the government doesn't have an obligation to recognize you as a revolution. And uh, with saying that, there is a difference between a riot and a revolution. And if you're just one singular person, I don't think that we can call what you're doing as a revolution. <laughs> okay, so you, you said it, so I gotta ask it. What's the difference between a riot and a revolution? I think a riot is a lot less justified than a revolution and it's breaking the natural rights of a lot of people. However, a revolution, it's when it's maybe more organized and everybody's coming in agreement and saying, this is not right and we're re uh, revolting against the government for this purpose. Uh, in, in other words, I would say that a riot is more of like an ill-mannered way of um, fighting for your opinion. I think that a revolution is more of uh, following the steps that you should take. Like for, for example, starting with like, a, uh, may I please finish my thought? Absolutely, please. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Um, so first starting with like a peaceful protest with like a, a group of people and not harming anyone else that disagrees with you and then uh, slowly taking further steps to what's your opinion. Thank you. And I do not want to end. Yep. Uh, this has been fantastic. And, uh, you know, I think 
I, I guess I'll, I, I guess I've started out. Sorry, You're guys. Starting. <laughs> <laughs> do, uh, Misha, do I have permission to go? Uh, I, I want to make sure I, I have permission. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, because before, I mean, you were acknowledging that people had the, the, the they were allowed to go ahead. So, uh, you know, this, this has been fantastic. Uh, you know, in your follow ups, uh, I'll, you know, you, you were able to make very nuanced distinctions. And I really thought that that was nice. Now, I, I'm not sure I, I agree with you. And that's totally irrelevant. It's totally irrelevant. You were able to make distinctions and actually take me to task. You know, go ahead and move to Southern Indiana, you goofball. Uh, enjoy your dog. Uh, or, or even taking Alan on, uh, that maybe he's just an ill-mannered, uh, crazy guy. Um, but, and, I, and that's very admirable. Yep. You, uh, we, we kind of wanted to push you around a little bit. And you, uh, you didn't want to be pushed around and pushed back. That is great. And I think that's truly, uh, there are many strengths of this presentation, but the fact that you push back and would not assume the premises of our questions is really wonderful, really wonderful. Uh, and I'll, I'll defer to my colleagues for, uh, uh, for their comments. I agree. I, I think the consistency in your responses, um, for someone commented, um, you know, don't believe that we're in a state of nature. Consistently answered that and defended it across the board. Um, again, doesn't matter what we think, but you were consistent in your presentation and you used your examples to illustrate that. So that is a great strength. Continue to use that moving forward uh, in your presentation style and great technique. I like, uh, I like uh, again, how Alan said, pushing back, uh, talking about the semantics of the question. Um, Arguing, uh, arguing that point and again, staying consistent. Uh, someone threw out there in a response about uh, you're signing a contract, which was an interesting idea, would have loved to explore uh, with more time. But I, I think the, the point here being that this was a conversation, you all have clearly a strong grasp of the material and we can continue the, to explore these ideas, um, both in historical and in contemporary context. So I want to applaud you for all the work that you've put in uh, this weekend, but all the work you and, and your teachers uh, have put in to get to this point. So wanna really thank you all and encourage you all to continue uh, moving forward. I'm, yes, I agree with everything that's been said. This is, look, this is tough stuff, guys, okay? This is not easy stuff and there's a lot of it in this question, okay? And what you showed me was a grasp of the material and as noted, a willingness to basically stare me back and say, no Broadman, you don't know what you're talking about. And that's okay. <laughs> in fact, that's a good thing. Um, in fact, some of my students would have said that a number of times, but the, the point being that you weren't just able to take a position, you're able to support your position. And, and that's the, the concept that we're looking for you to learn here about how an argument needs to be made and the comfort of doing that with, with people that can be intimidating, okay? Tim's an intimidating man, but, um, sorry, we're just having some fun. But bottom line is guys, I was, I was impressed um, overall with your presentation, really very, very fine job, thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.